Thank you for coming to our Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, we have a special uh, guest lecturer who will be focusing on our program, CTEF, uh, AKA Chronic Thrombin Body Pulmonary Hypertension. As you may recall, uh, January of this year, we embarked on this program. And this is a very um, uh, special um, disease state where it's far under recognized and underdiagnosed. But the amazing thing is, it is curative. And whether a patient gets there or not, really a largely depends on the imaging, interpretation, and also uh, correlation of the information clinical with the imaging process. So that was the introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Deepa Gopla, our uh, speaker this morning. Uh, Deepa is a consultant for cardiovascular radiologist at Imperial College Healthcare Trust in London and Cambridge University Hospitals in Cambridge, UK. She had extensive training uh, as a specialist registrar in radiology with the East Eng <laughs> Anglican uh, Specialist Registrar Training Program at Cambridge and completed a fellowship in cardiothoracic radiology at Papworth Hospital in Cambridge and also at uh, Erasmus Hospital in Rotterdam, Netherlands. Uh, she also trained in nuclear medicine at UCH Middlesex Hospital in London and in vascular intervention at the Sheffield Vascular Unit in Sheffield, UK. Uh, she is currently the lead radiologist for pulmonary hypertension imaging at Hammersmith Hospital in London, and as well as an associate lecturer at Cambridge University and honorary senior lecturer at the Imperial College in London. Between 2007 and 2014, she was also the lead radiologist for the pulmonary hypertension imaging at Papsworth Hospital, which is also the national endorectomy center for the UK. And this is a surgery that is curative for, pulmonary, for uh, CTEF uh, disease. She has uh, published widely on a specialist uh, subject for pulmonary hypertension, non-invasive cardiac imaging, and especially the multimodality imaging for CTEF, and, and frequently participates as a speaker at, at national and international conferences. She is a, a delightful individual uh, and, and widely known throughout the uh, 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 CTEF center around the country and also uh, in the world. So it is my sincere pleasure to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Gopla. Thank you very much for those very kind words. And good morning. I have to say it's a great pleasure to be here in Houston, and I think it's the glorious sunshine is brilliant. I left London when there were thunderstorms last night, so this is great. Um, what I thought I'd begin with is to show you this slide. Now, chronic thromboembolic disease for a very long time has been considered to be a rare form of pulmonary hypertension, and this rarity is seen in the amount of publications that you've had relating to CTEF over the last few years. However, in the last couple of years, we've had major changes in our understanding of the disease, and uh, the CTEF has now become a very sexy subject. More so because it's now got its own Facebook page, a Twitter feed, and so on and so forth. And you know you've made it when you've got all those things. Now, joking aside, I have to say that this escalation of clinical interest is because of two things. A, there has been successful modifications of existing treatment, which is pulmonary endarterectomy. Also, emergence of new treatment modalities in the form of balloon pulmonary angioplasty, as well as... Um, Rheosigwat, which is the first medical therapy that's available to treat this disease. Whilst it's true that our understanding of this disease has been facilitated by insights into the epigenetics, pharmacotherapy, as well as pathophysiological mechanisms, I think it's fair to say advances in imaging has actually reshaped our approach to CTEF. With that in mind, what I'm going to do over the next 45 minutes or so is to take you through the evolution of pulmonary embolism from the acute through to the chronic stage. And although I'm a radiologist, I sincerely believe this disease more than a lot of other diseases, an understanding of the pathophysiology is absolutely pivotal to understanding what imaging shows. And therefore, the first part of my talk is going to be concentrating on the pathophysiology I will, of course, take you through the various imaging modalities that are available in mainstream care, clinical care, and we'll look at the limitations of these modalities. Finally, I'll touch on the current international guidelines for CTEF, not just for diagnosis, but also for treatment. Now, at the outset, I have to say 
that the definition for pulmonary hypertension is hemodynamic. It's got three components, a mean, resting mean pulmonary artery pressure of more than 25 millimeters of mercury, pulmonary artery capillary wedge pressure of less than 15 millimeters of mercury, and a pulmonary vascular resistance of more than three wood units. And that, the right heart catheter point, is not going to change for quite a few years. You do need that in order to make your diagnosis. But where imaging comes in is multifactorial. It can confirm the presence of the disease, identify the underlying etiology, take you through the evaluation of the underlying right ventricular function, direct appropriate treatment, monitor the response to treatment as well as disease progression. So going just a step back and look at where CTEF sits in this classification of pulmonary hypertension, you have five groups. And most of you would be familiar with the first three groups. But CTEF and other diseases that occlude the pulmonary arterial circulation sits in group four. And that's the disease that we are going to be talking about now. And before I go any further, I have to tell you, remember that chronic thromboembolic disease is not just a blood clot. Acute pulmonary embolism is a blood clot. Chronic thromboembolic disease is much more than that. If a patient with CTEF has got a mean pulmonary artery pressure of more than 50 millimeters of mercury, their three-year mortality rate, if you do not treat that patient, is more than 90%. But fortunately for us, we have a modality, a form of treatment which is completely curative, and that is pulmonary thromboendarterectomy. However, there are other forms of treatment that have come up, and we will touch on these a bit later on in the talk. The natural history of the disease is quite interesting. Most of the times when you have got patients with acute pulmonary embolism, the majority of the clot is going to resolve without giving the patient any persistent hemodynamic compromise. But there is a small proportion of patients, and it is a small proportion, that go on to develop chronic thromboembolic disease. And the trick is to work out which group of these patients go on to develop CTEF. We do have some clues. We know that if the patient has got recurrent clinical or subclinical thromboembolic events, if they've got a genetic predisposition, if they are prothrombotic, such as if they are positive for antiphospholipid syndromes, if they've got ongoing inflammation, such as inflammatory bowel disease or infection, or even malignancy, there's a greater chance that that group of patients would go on to develop CTEF. Also, the younger the age of the patient at the time of their first presentation, the larger the PE, the more perfusion defects that you have. And if you've got an unprovoked pulmonary embolism in the first place, then there is a very good chance that that patient will go on to develop chronic thromboembolic disease. The epidemiology of the disease, however, is difficult, and it's made difficult by a number of factors. The first thing you have to remember is a lot of the times, acute pulmonary embolism, up to 50% of cases, it can be silent. So it's subclinical acute PE. So when you have got patients with CTEF, you may not necessarily get a past history of pulmonary embolism. The second thing is there is a lot of confusion about the incidence and the prevalence of the disease. And this is so because when the patient's present with an acute episode, what you don't know is, is it truly acute PE or what they are having is acute on chronic pulmonary thromboembolic disease. And that's an important distinction because you don't want this group of patients to undergo an embolectomy, which is the treatment for acute PE. It will not work for chronic thromboembolic disease. And this distinction has to be made. Is it acute? truly acute or is it acute on chronic? The third factor to remember from the imaging point of view is more than 50% of defects that you see on imaging can persist from the time of the first presentation. I've said six months there, but there are studies that show they can persist even up to one year. So you don't really know looking at the images with what you're seeing, the perfusion defect that you're seeing is a relatively new thing or is this something that's been persistent from their first episode? Also, there's a lot of misconception about the disease, and it's frankly misdiagnosed. Having said all of that, if you look at the literature, the incidence that most people believe of CTEF is about 3 to 5 percent. Now we go into the pathophysiology, and this is a macroscopic specimen of what acute pulmonary embolism looks like. So you see this clot, 
it's interdigitating areas of tan and red. It's got irregular surface. And that is very, very different from the specimen of chronic thromboembolic disease, which is going to look like that. So you get thickened bits of fibrous tissue. Why is there a difference? And for this, you need to go and look at microscopic level. So this is what happens with acute pulmonary embolism. In the first instance, microscopically, what you see are in acute PE, the so-called lines of ZAN. And what they are are layers of thrombin, fibrin, platelets that gets laid down within the thrombus. This is acute PE. The next step that happens is what we call clot reorganization. And what happens at that level is the thrombus gets transformed into a vascularized connective tissue that adheres to the vessel wall. With treatment, this may completely resolve, and by treatment, I mean anticoagulation, or you progress on to the next stage, and that's called recanalization, and that's where you get these vascular channels forming within the thrombus. And what that does is the organized bit of the thrombus, the organized clot, will then convert itself into these septations of elastin and fibrin. And this is what we are going to see on imaging. The final step in the process is intimal proliferation and medial hypertrophy resulting in the so-called uh, plexiform lesions. So that is a very brief summary of what happens at the pathophysiological level. So you can see how imaging is going to be different when you look at an acute specimen compared to a chronic specimen. Now, if you again read the literature on types of chronic thromboembolic disease, you will see that there are four types. But I have to emphasize, this is very important, this classification is an intraoperative classification. It's not what you see, but it's what you actually find when you open the patient. So four types. Type one is when the disease is in the main pulmonary artery, so the surgeon opens the vessel and it's there within the main pulmonary artery, and this accounts for up to 10% of cases. Type two is the more common type, and what you see in type two is thickened intima, and the disease is in the lobar and the proximal segmental vessels, and this accounts for 70% of cases. Type three is much more difficult, and this is the, in the gray zone. Are they suitable for surgery? Are they not suitable for surgery? Because the disease at this level is in kind of mid to distal segments and in the subsegmental level, and this accounts for another 10%. And type 4 is truly one of those diseases which is at the microscopic level. It's the small vessel disease. So in imaging, you don't see anything. And when the surgeon opens it, it's a heart sink moment because they do not see any disease discernible in the pulmonary vasculature. And this is the disease which is, this type 4 is the disease which is not suitable either for surgery or for balloon pulmonary angioplasty. This patient may actually need to have rear which is the medical treatment. Now, the diagnosis of CTEF is made challenging by a variety of conditions. The first factor is it does not, there is no clinical suspicion of this disease. So approximately the median time between the presentation and the time that the patients get diagnosed worldwide is about 14 months. Therefore, and the other important thing to say is there is no agreed international guidelines as to when should you follow up patients and how should you follow up patients once they have, once they have had acute PE. We know that they should be followed up, but do you follow everybody? That's a waste of resources. Do you only follow a certain group? And if so, which group do you follow? A rough rule of the thumb is CTEF should be considered in all patients who have got unexplained pulmonary hypertension, whether or not they've got previous history of thromboembolic disease. That's number one. And number two is patients who have previously had acute PE or who have got persistent dyspnea of unexplained origin after three months of anticoagulation should be, you should think, have they got thromboembolic disease. Early diagnosis is important because the earlier you institute the treatment, the better the outcomes. So now we go on to imaging. So what do we have to image the pulmonary circulation? That's where you're spoiled for choice because you've got a variety of imaging techniques that you could use. The fundamental thing to remember is you require a morphological modality and a functional modality. It does not matter what you choose, and you've got a variety of things to choose from. Traditionally, people have opted for a VQ scan and a catheter pulmonary angiography to give you this combined information. Recently, with advances in CT technique, people have looked to do a CTPA and a dual energy CT. 
at the bottom you've got the new kit on the block which is MRI and with MR you're going to get excellent consistent reproducible right ventricular functional analysis and you're also going to be able to look at the pulmonary vasculature in very good detail. I have to say at this point, don't be taken misled by all these fancy imaging techniques. Go what you feel comfortable with. Remember, you need anatomy and physiology to make up your mind what treatment to give the patient. But having said that, you need to go along with what equipment that you have and more importantly, what expertise you have in looking at these images. Okay. Now. I'll start with VQ scintigraphy. Say you've got a patient with dyspnea, they've undergone an echocardiography and they're known to have pulmonary hypertension. What is the next step? Well, the next step is to exclude thromboembolic disease because this is the only curable form of pulmonary hypertension. And that's an important point to remember. So you want to make sure that you're not denying your patient treatment. So What's the test that you have amongst all the tests that I've shown you that's got the highest sensitivity for doing this? And that's going to be a VQ scan. VQ scan, which is ventilation perfusion scintigraphy, has had a lot of bad publicity. And that is because in acute pulmonary embolism, nuclear medicine has become unclear medicine because of all the, um, uh, the, 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 the criteria that they use for looking at the studies. You, you would have all heard of biopet criteria. It's very confusing. You need to put in key in the, the pretest probability. And if you don't have the correct information, the amount of uh, the reliance that you can place on the result goes down. But for chronic thromboembolic disease, remember, and this is an important issue, all you want to know from your VQ scan, from your perfusion scan is, is there a perfusion defect or is there no perfusion defect? So simply a binary thing. If there is no perfusion defect, you are unlikely to be dealing with thromboembolic disease as a cause of pulmonary hypertension. If on the other hand, if you have got a positive perfusion scan, it's very likely that you're dealing with thromboembolic disease. Remember, I'm not saying it is thromboembolic disease because you can have false positive perfusion defects, and that's a next slide. But just remember, binary, negative, unlikely to be thromboembolic, positive, very likely that they've got thromboembolic disease. And this is something that is easy enough for anybody to see and do. And therefore, in all the guidelines that you will see, both the American guidelines and European guidelines, VQ scintigraphy is very high up on the diagnostic algorithm. But remember, it's a screening test. It's not a diagnostic test. It's a screening test. Once you've got a positive perfusion scan, and this is an example of multiple segmental perfusion defects, you need to go on and image them further. And that imaging can be CT, MR, catheter. It doesn't matter, but you need some kind of cross-sectional imaging at this point. One other thing to remember is, if you've got a perfusion defect and you do not have a baseline scan, you don't know if that perfusion defect is because of acute pulmonary embolism or chronic thromboembolic disease because the defects look the same. Now, this is the false positive VQ. There are multiple causes. I've just chosen this because it's an important cause. So here you've got complete loss of perfusion on one side. And I'll tell you that the ventilation was normal because the ventilation is on the right-hand side of the screen. So preserved ventilation, absent perfusion. Could this be thromboembolic disease? It could be, but if you look at the MR pulmonary angiogram, the left side is completely normal, and the right side is complete loss of perfusion. Usually, and by a general rule, thromboembolic disease is a bilateral disease process, although you can have unilateral disease. But unilateral disease is atypical rather than the norm, and when you see this, alarm bells should start to go off, and we went on to do further imaging, and this is their PET study, and what you see is increased uptake in the systemic vasculature, and this happens to be a case of Takayasu's vasculitis. So, VQ scan, excellent sensitivity, but poor specificity. Just remember that. On the false positive note, pulmonary artery sarcoma will also give you perfusion defects, but your cross-sectional imaging should tell you that it's unlikely to be thromboembolic disease. What's new on the VQ front? All the images that you've seen so far is planar imaging. This is an example of SPECT VQ. And essentially, SPECT is a 3D imaging rather than the planar, which is 2D imaging. And with SPECT VQ, you can combine it with CT, so you're going to get more information. 
SpectreQ is an up-and-coming technique, so it takes a little bit of time to get used to what you're going to see, but it's increasing the sensitivity of your pickup rate. So one thing to say is VQ, I keep mentioning this high sensitivity, it can be performed in patients who've got renal impairment. So before you jump in to do CT, consider VQ, okay? The limitations are, A, it can be unavailable, and I know in this day and age that seems odd, but at an international level, there are places where you do not have a VQ. The more important problem for the states is, and this is true for a lot of Europe as well, it's underutilized because people think this is not a good test because they're extrapolating their experience with acute PE to chronic PE and thinking this is unclear, I'm not going to get much information, I want to do a CT. But just remember, two different disease processes, and therefore, for chronic disease, this is a really good test. Now, CT. Now, I don't have to tell you anything about CT. It's the truth machine. Everybody loves CT, so I'm not here to tell you, you know, to, as an advert for CT. But having said that, I love it because it's exquisite anatomical delineation that you don't get from a lot of other modalities for the price of a single Venflon. Okay? Now, if you look at a CT, I just want to tell you, look at it in the context of this disease in three forms. Look at the vasculature both pulmonary as well as bronchial vasculature, because remember, you can get bronchial collaterals with this disease. Look at the lung parenchyma for mosaic attenuation pattern, the presence of infarcts and parenchymal lung disease and so on. Don't forget to look at the heart. You don't necessarily need an ECG-gated study to comment on the heart on a CTPA. It's just that we are not used to doing this. The heart is this inconvenient white blob in the center of the lungs on a CT for most radiologists. But if you look for it, you will see a lot of things, including right-sided chamber dilatation, the presence or absence of intracardiac shunts, pulmonary venous anatomy, all of which, if there is a problem, can result in pulmonary hypertension. So spend a moment or two to look at the heart, which yesterday, whilst we were having supper, one of your cardiologists, Ash, asked me, do you actually do ECG gating? Okay. I have to say, I don't routinely gate my CTPAs. But if you do do it for whatever reason, you are going to get data that looks like this. For those of you who are not used to looking at this kind of data, on the left, you've got on the top deck a short axis, and then a coronal view, a four-chamber view, and a volume-rendered view. And you can see the right heart is dilated, the right ventricle is hypertrophy. You've got the paradoxical septal motion. So plenty of information. I can plug this data into my... Uh, computer workstation, and it will give me volumes, right ventricular volumes and right ventricular ejection fraction. The bottom line is you're not really going to be doing serial CTs to do the RV function when you've got better non-invasive modalities with no radiation, such as echo and MRI. So I wouldn't rush in to do ECG gating for RV function. The times that I do like it is when I'm suspecting something else that is a complication of thromboembolic disease. And in this case, you can see that there is big, unreasonably enlarged pulmonary artery, MPA, main pulmonary artery, that's causing compression of the left main stem. So if you want to look for this kind of complication, ECG gating is phenomenal. And therefore, I would suggest a few minutes extra that you spend in attaching the patient to ECG electrode is worth it. Um, what else is new? I'll just touch on the dual energy CT. I know you've got a very, very good scanner, the Siemens flash scanner, and it's got the capability to do dual energy, and this is a technological advance. What it is is, if in, this is an patient with acute PE, so if you've got a thrombus, you're going to have a perfusion defect. So with CT now, you can look at the iodine distribution map at the pulmonary vascular bed. Do you really need it if you can see the clot? Not really. Where it is helpful, and it's been shown to be helpful, is in acute PE, where you cannot see the clot because it's subsegmental, but you can see the perfusion defect as a result of that clot. Where can we use this? How can we use this in chronic thromboembolic disease? Well, you see similar patterns. So you see two patterns. You can either see occluded vessel with no perfusion, or you can see occluded vessel with preserved proximal perfusion because the bronchial circulation takes it. And personally, where I see it going in distal thromboembolic disease is you have got a patient who has got pulmonary hypertension, preserved proximal vasculature, as you can see, but on the dual energy, you see peripheral perfusion defects. 
and that increases your clinical suspicion that the patient has got thromboembolic disease. You cannot stop there. You have to go to the next test. The limitations are, for a, it's true, and I don't like talking about gold standards because it's always changing, but it is true for acute PE, you want a CTPA. For chronic, we are not there yet for the simple reason a negative CTPA does not exclude distal thromboembolic disease. Some places, including mine, where we have used CT for very many years, we actually use CT not just for diagnosis, but also to tell us, is this patient operable? Is this patient suitable for surgery or not? But also remember, CT will show you false positive. You know, you need to know what the stachiasis going to look like on a CTPA, what's a sarcoma going to look like, what's fibrosing mediastinitis looking like, because they can all look like CTF. Moving over, right ventricular function. Remember, the pulmonary circulation thus is not insular. It's a combined unit with the right ventricle, so you need to evaluate the right ventricular function, and you can do it very beautifully with cardiac MR. Just like CT with cardiac MR, we look at it in three forms. You want to look at the morphology and function, and this is the best modality that you have to look at the right ventricular function. You also want to look at the flows, but in this occasion, you're not just looking at it, but you're actually quantifying it and also looking for bronchopulmonary shunt fraction because the presence of bronchial collaterals is increasing, you're giving you a better prognostication in terms of surgery, and also you're looking at the vasculature. Two ways of looking at the vasculature. This is called a time-resolved MRA, and you're looking at the perfusion bed, and you can quantify the extent of perfusion should you have the time or the inclination to do it. And then, of course, you have the so-called uh, spatial, high spatial resolution MR angiography. And it takes a little bit of time getting used to this. But once you get used to this, there are papers. And there is, from personal experience, the endarterectomy plane matches very well with what you see, the disease on MR angiography. Of course, with MRI, you're going to be given multiple flow data, not just the flow, but the velocity of flow and so on and so forth, and the pulmonary artery capacitance and so on and so forth. Do you really need it? Well, I have to say in my routine clinical practice, I don't give them a lot of information apart from the flow and the shunt fraction, but should you need it, that information is there. And that leads us on to, can you use all that information that MR is willing to give you to estimate the pulmonary artery pressure? And I have to confess that there is currently, today, no reproducible way of using MRI to give you non-invasive measurement of pulmonary artery pressure. And that is why we are still dependent on right heart catheterization. But give it two to three years, and things are really going to change. So the diagnostic utility of CTEF, uh, MRI for CTEF, is that you are going to get abundant functional data, so it's a very good test to have. And I know in your institution, you've got an excellent cardiac MR unit, so you can use this modality. But the flip side of this is, it's a long examination time. It takes about 45 minutes to an hour to get all of the information that you want. Patients are claustrophobic, they're really breathless, and they don't like it. But if you can convince your patient, by all means, try and use this. Pulmonary angiography, again, this is one of those techniques that went out of fashion, at least for radiologists, because you had CT taking over it. Um, now there is a resurgence of interest in pulmonary angiography because you can use it as a preamble for balloon pulmonary angioplasty. So if you've got the disease and if they're not suitable for surgery, you should put them through the BPA group. And for that, you've got one more trick up your sleeve, and that's this. This is DynaCT where you can use, and I know you've got this in your institution. They told me this yesterday. And what this is, is you use this machine, which is in your fluoroscopic room. You use one arm for fluoroscopy and the other arm for CT. And you can use this to A, increase your diagnostic confidence, B, reduce the amount of radiation, reduce procedure time, and so on and so forth. Very, very advantageous if you have it and if you're using it. The last couple of slides, or a few slides, are going to be touching on what are you actually going to see on imaging. Now, I have to say that this was initially described by Bill Auger and Ken Moser from that very famous institute for pulmonary endarterectomy, which happens to be San Diego. They were the ones who pioneered this technique. And this paper came out in radiology in 1992 by Bill Auger, and he described the abnormalities. I think it's very fair to say that we still use those descriptions. It's just how we look at it that has changed. So these are what you're looking for. The first thing is a 
occlusion. And I've put the different modalities, and you can see they look exactly the same. So the vessel is occluded, and you can see there is no flow in the left lower lip. You have these so-called pouch defects, which is this convexity that you get beyond which there is just this trickle of contrast. Of all the signs that you see for CTEF, this is the most specific sign, the pouch defect, because other conditions like tachyasis and your sarcoma don't give you this pouch defect. So the presence of the pouch defect is very highly sensitive for CTEF. The next thing you're going to be looking for is the presence of stenosis. And when the vessel is stenosed, you're going to have post-stenotic dilatation. The webs and the shelves, now these are, if you go back to your pathophysiological stuff that I showed you quite earlier on, this is the organized clot that is left in the form of septations of fibrin and elastin and collagen fibers, and that's what it looks like. And you can see on the pulmonary angiogram, if you don't take an orthogonal view, it's easy to miss the shelves. With MRI, because you've got the so-called rotating multiplanar imaging, maximum intensity projection, the chances of missing a web is much less than with catheter angiography. Intimal irregularities, this is the same as any other vessel. CT is very good both for looking at the lumen as well as the vessel wall. So again, if you think the patient has got intimal irregularities, go back and look at the CT. You will see that eccentric thrombus much, much better compared to catheter angiography or MRI. Perfusion defects, again, what you're seeing is this so-called segmental perfusion defects. If you do a pulmonary angiogram, keep your foot long enough on the pedal so that you get to see the capillary phase. For VQ, remember, because you are injecting macroaggregates, they're tiny. So if you've got a web, these aggregates can get through, the particles can get through the web. So the VQ can look very underwhelming. It's abnormal, but it's very underwhelming. Whereas in reality, the patient has got pretty high pulmonary vascular resistance. So don't be fooled by the extent of defects that you see on VQ. Finally, this is a paper that came out two, three years ago where they compared the different imaging modalities, and you see CT scores pretty, pretty highly. This is not yet reflected in the guidelines because most people don't know what they're looking at on the CT, so it's received, you know, it's not there yet, but the guidelines are going to be revised in the next two years, and I think CT will feature much higher up in the guidelines. So that brings me back to the guidelines. If you suspect the patient has got pulmonary hypertension, you have echo. If they have got no pulmonary hypertension, you stop. If they have got pulmonary hypertension, do a VQ scan. If the VQ is negative, this is unlikely to be thromboembolic disease. So go down looking for all your other four causes of pulmonary hypertension for groups. If the VQ is positive, you need to do a CTPA. And then what happens is, this is you confirm the presence of the disease. Then you have to characterize the disease, and you can do that by CT, MR, or by catheter angiography. It's your choice. Once you've done that, you have to evaluate the right ventricular function. You do that with echo or with cardiac MR or both because they're quite complementary. And finally, you need your right heart catheterization to tell you what the pulmonary vascular resistance is. This is important. If you've got the pulmonary vascular resistance that is disproportionately high, compared to what you're seeing on imaging, it's likely that they've got a very high small vessel component, and therefore they may not be suitable for surgery. Three treatment arms, the, the mainstay of treatment is still pulmonary endarterectomy. If, is there any contraindication to pulmonary endarterectomy? Very few, age, obesity, they're all not contraindications, but uh, if you've got comorbidities such as bad emphysema or irreversible left ventricular failure, that may be a relative contraindication. Of course, common sense. If the patient has got less than six months to live, then you don't want to subject them to the surgery. If the patient refuses, then you don't want to put them through surgery. The medical treatment is Rio Ciguat. It's now FDA approved and it's available in the U.S. The interventional arm is up and coming, balloon pulmonary angioplasty. And I think the next few years are going to, we're going to see a lot more of BPA. So my recommendations are VQ is a screening test. It's got very high sensitivity. Don't forget to do it. CTPA in experience centers, it's very, very good, not just for diagnosis, but also for looking at the technical operability. Cardiac MR is no longer an esoteric test. You learn to teach your clinicians. Well, we as radiologists need to teach our clinical colleagues that it's not an esoteric test. It can give you a lot of information. The catheter pulmonary angiography for radiologists is a lost skill. We need to relearn it, particularly if you want to do BPA. 
And finally, finally, my personal bugbear, multidisciplinary team meeting. Now, I spoke to your surgeon first thing this morning, and what he said was, you have a heart team for TAVI. Why not consider having a pulmonary hypertension team similar to your heart team? Because the success of your program for CTEF is going to be hinging on whether you've got a good MDT team. And for that, you need uh, clinicians, pulmonologists, cardiologists, your surgeons, your interventionalists, and a radiologist. If you ask nicely, I'm sure that your radiologist would be more than happy to get involved in the process. And if you discuss all of your patients, all of their imaging, you're going to have less of a surprise when the patient goes for whatever treatment that you're going to subject them to. So the reflections are that this is the only curable form of pulmonary hypertension, and hence people go on and on about it. The true incidence of the disease is unknown because there are lots of compounding factors. We have to remember that you need to have a systematic way of following up patients after acute pulmonary embolism. The earlier you put the patient through the treatment pathway, the better the outcomes. Confirmation of disease requires a CTEF center. What's an expert CTEF center? I didn't mention this before. And again, there are guidelines for this. So an expert pulmonary hypertension center for CTEF is one where they have done at least 20 pulmonary endarterectomy cases with a mortality rate of 10% over one year. The, that, that is an acceptable um, number. If you truly consider yourself as an expert, they want you to have done 50 cases and mortality rate of less than 5% and you're willing to take on the more complex disease that the next center is not willing to take on. And remember, multidisciplinary team meeting with a friendly radiologist is the key to having a successful program. Thank you. Everybody, thank you for that wonderful talk and what a great overview. Zenith, hello. Of, of this uh, com We do have a team that we go over our cases every yeah. month and we try to bring our radiologist and they are very friendly, of course. Uh, so um, what I was going to ask you, is there some program in UK that has been undertaken to increase the diagnostic uh, di diagnosis of CETA? For example, we, we always you know, worry about and we say that it's underdiagnosed in US also. And I'll tell you what, one thing, in some of the hospitals in the periphery, in small uh, cities, they don't have VQ modalities even in U.S. So in U.S. getting VQ is also becoming more and more difficult and challenging. So I think uh, it's a very fair comment that you have all these modalities, but they are not widely available or they are underused. What do you do for that? In the U.K., it's a very, very small country. We've got one center which does endotrectomy. So anybody who's got pulmonary hypertension, their images get sent over and it gets discussed in an MDT meeting. And therefore, you know, the, the, the training becomes less of an issue because it gets concentrated in one center, right? Here, you've got multiple centers, so what do you do? There are three training forums that you could tap into. First is masterclass. I know we've got some of the Bayer people here. They do a lot of masterclass, and these masterclasses involve taking not just physicians, but also radiologists to center, which do a lot of these, and see how they do it and what they do. You have got an international uh, CTEF community association, and they have got a website. You, can, you should be a member, but it's free to tap into, and you can load your cases and say, I want radiologist X, Y, and Z to have my, a look at my case. It's completely confidential, and you can have a one-to-one -one or two-to-one -to -one dialogue with this person to see what it is. The third option, which is what happens in reality, is if you have a radiologist that you know, whether it's your center or a different center, and if it's something that you're not sure about or if there is a debate or uncertainty, you just send the images to them and say, what do you think? At this point, I know it's unsatisfactory, but there is a lot of um, training to do, and uh, the pharmaceutical industry has actually taken it on board, and therefore CTEF is now featuring a lot more in radiology community than it used to, but it's going to take a little bit of time to get there. Any other questions? Yes. 
but they haven't had their pulmonary hypertension yet, or borderline, or even normal. Uh, how do you manage them? Do you have data that intervening on them would improve outcome? No. So um, what, and this brings us back to how long have they had the defects, are these defects significant, and so on and so forth. So if you as a nuclear physician or a radionuclide radiologist have a scan, in a patient who's got perfusion defects. You are a lit your hands are tied unless you speak to your clinicians and say, is this patient known to have pH? If not, they should have an echo. So in my clinical practice, if such a scan comes through, my and I have no, you know, it just says breathless as what happens in real life, I would say this has got mismatched perfusion defects. The differential is wide. And I would suggest an echocardiography in the first instance to see if the patient has got pulmonary hypertension. You are only going to pick up cases of resting pulmonary hypertension. It doesn't take into account patients who've got exercise-induced pH. And that is something that the guidelines have kind of shelved to the background because it's a very difficult topic. You know, should these patients have CPET? Should they have an exercise echo? We don't know. But at least if you know they haven't got pulmonary hypertension, you may be dealing with chronic thromboembolic disease rather than chronic thromboembolic pulmonary hypertension, but you've plugged them in the program by asking your clinical colleagues to do an echo and take it from there. I, I, think, I think actually that's a very interesting emerging topic of CTED as, as to how to better uh, manage and follow these patients with uh, radiographically you know, significant uh, disease, but really physiologically yet not quite there. And, and actually, we, they're, especially in San Diego, they do have a, a group of patients that they have uh, intervened, and actually with results that, that are really excellent. So I think this is a whole different segment of the, of the uh, disease of CTEF, offspring, earlier case, that is emerging as for both management and now that you know, our armamentarium is growing. Ash? You know? Do they Actually, recommend what, what, following them regularly? I mean, post or pre? Pre. So, pre so they, don't, they have not developed pulmonary hypertension as yet, right. as, at least at rest. They might have it at, at exercise. We no. don't do exercise. I mean, we do exercise in our cath lab, but sometimes, sometimes we don't do exercise and they are not done. So what do you do for these patients? I mean, you personally, would you follow them? What we, what we used to do is getting MRI. I think this is where an MRI is really a, a true benefit. You get a baseline and periodically assess, keep an eye on their, on their RV function. But we actually, we did uh, 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 have a, an eye on their exercise modality. And actually, we use six-minute walk, exercise, uh, right heart cath, and actually, in some instances, exercise cycle just to see, see a lifetime, the, the RV imaging, depending on their age and their risk factors. I think there are different modalities that you can use. I don't know what kind of practice so that you So I can tell you a little bit about this because in Papworth, we've published the largest series of patients with CTED who actually underwent pulmonary endarterectomy. So these are patients who have the disease radiologically, but at a functional level, at a exercise level, they don't have pulmonary hypertension unless you look at their, C, uh, their CPET, okay? If the patient is young, they may not be in your group two, group three, WHO group three, group th uh, two, three symptoms, right? But what do you do? And we know earlier you intervene on the patients before the right ventricle remodels itself, the better the outcome. So that patient has to have a talk with your surgeon. And if the surgeon feels that the disease is gettable, even if it's like five segments, they haven't got pulmonary hypertension, then you put them through surgery. Because at least at that point, you don't have irreversible RV remodeling. So they do very well. And actually, I mean, those patients, I think, has the best outcome. Outcome. It's really yeah. durable. It's just actually. finding those patients that's tricky. Ash? Yeah, no, uh, great talk. And one other thing with CTED was, you know, I think there's more and more use of even CPAT. Yes. Especially yeah. in looking at whether there is VEVCO2, uh, you know, increase. And, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's a brilliant test for that. Yeah. Uh, and another thing is, you know, as you know, like CTEF is more diagnosed in the uh, later decades of life, and there's a lot of coexisting disease, whether it's, you know, uh, left Same, heart disease yeah. or intrinsic lung disease like COPD or, and, uh, you know, using just VQ scan in that, those settings also make it very hard. And even, uh, even yeah. with echo, you know, you get a lot of either false positives yeah. or false negatives. Yeah. 
do you think the sort of the the, the diagnostic algorithm in, in you know should uh, be I don't know, reworked in depending on the populations you're looking at yeah, that's a can of worms but i have to tell you last week we had the expert panel meeting in toronto to look at this Okay. When you have compounding factors, weak, you may not be helpful. What do you do? What do you do with CTED patients? You're going to miss a large proportion. And what came out of that meeting was CT should come higher than VQ, right? You don't forget VQ because it's still very useful, but CT should come higher. And the message is if the neg CT is negative, don't forget to do your VQ rather than the other way around, okay? But that's going to involve, at least in the European sector, the clinicians are very, very fond of VQ, okay? There's, they've relied on it for so long and they've had good um, relationship with VQ scanners compared to CT scanners, so they like VQ. So it's going, to, it's going to be a change in, a paradigm shift in the change that they're thinking. So when these guidelines do get revised, I think there's going to be a lot of um, cantering at people who are radiologists who are saying do CT and clinicians saying, no, I want VQ. We are not saying can the VQ, we are just saying just change the way the algorithm works. It, it'll change. It will change for, in two years' time. I have a question just uh, projecting ahead, or maybe you've already seen it worldwide, is, I mean, there's more talk or uh, discussion about having a surgical intervention coupled with in, uh, in, in interventional yeah. Yes. yes, maybe staged or maybe in the same sitting. Now, have you been participant in such a case? And is there a radiological difference that you can see in terms of more complete resolution of the flow yeah. with some with just you know in a, a CT versus yeah. VQ? Um, personally, no. But I've heard instances where this has been done. Now, the one major place where they do BPA over and top of uh, surgery is Japan. But those series is very biased because even the patients who should be undergoing surgery are undergoing BPA. So you can't depend on the Japanese literature to give you the answer. It's Europe that you're going to be looking at. Germany and France have now got a very good BPA uh, um, program. And they have not done a combined case, but what they have done is patients have undergone surgery. They have persistent pulmonary hypertension in the post-surgical phase. What do you do? Because the surgeon is reluctant to take them back Okay, it's got its own attendant difficulties. So in that case, should if you have got significant persistent CTEF, and the definition for that is very variable, but if you've got that group of patients, can you put them through balloon pulmonary angioplasty? And the answer is apparently yes. And I've also been told that the surgery doesn't actually alter that material that much that it makes it difficult to do BPA. So BPA can be done, and it has been done with good results, but the cases are like anecdotal rather than a series. So I think it's too early to say. Thank you. Any other comments? Yes, Louis? Uh, so really fantastic talk. Um, one of the things I sort of want to push you now for is thinking about the future. So we kind of touched on this last night, but I wanted to sort of pick your brain a little bit more uh, formally. Where do you think things will go in the future as far as understanding functional perfusion? Because I think, it, at least in my mind, that's sort of the brass ring of what we want to understand, is where are you going to get the best bang for your buck, whether it's BPA versus um, um, uh, thrombendorotorectomy. I mean, is there a way that eventually we can get to understand which segment of lung is going to benefit from the most um, and where you should target your therapy? Yeah. So I think two things to that. I think anatomically looking at it, we are going to have more and more use of the so-called super selective angiograms that you can do with your DynaCT. Okay, so there is no question in my mind, if you start, I haven't shown you those images, but if you see those images where you've got your catheter within the distal vessel and if you have just imaged it, it doesn't start to compare with the standard catheter angiography. There is no question at all that anatomically that's going to be showing you the best, most exquisite delineation of the subsegmental vessels. At a functional level, to look at that perfusion bed, currently it's tedious to do, okay? Um, your, uh, when you have your du dual energy, that can do it. But we don't really understand what iodine distribution actually is doing. Uh, and I think MR, MR is the way to go. You have the 4D flows MR, which I had on my title slide, okay? The fourth dimension is time. And what you're seeing is the flow vortices on the, uh, I'll just go back and show you that slide. Um, 
These are the flow vortices within the pulmonary vasculature. And they have used this in the context of idiopathic pulmonary arterial hypertension to say, when you have disturbed vortex of flow, either in the pulmonary circulation or in the right ventricle, you can start to pick up latent pulmonary hypertension. So instead of doing CPET, if you have this, and we don't understand this very well, but if you have this and if you can do this, you're going to pick up more cases. So I think this is one of the holy grails. And the other holy grail is, of course, if you can have two holy grails, is can you use this modality, MRI, to tell you non-invasively what's the pulmonary vascular resistance? Can you segregate it to say the vascular resistance in the proximal bit contribution for the increased pulmonary vascular resistance from the proximal circulation is X, from the distal circulation is Y. Can you do a segregation model? Can you do a compartmental model? And there are models, fine models, where they've tried to do that. I think the trick is to translate that into humans. And if you can do that, you've got a winner on your hands. Thank you. Thank you, Deepa, for a yes. wonderful session. Thank you.